The tenth collect after Sunday, let us pray. Let thy merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers, petitions, desires of your servants, and then that they may obtain what they ask. Cause them to ask that which is good in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, we continue our work here with the hymnal, a paraphrase of Psalm 121 from the 1650 Scottish Psalter. He will not let thy foot be moved. His own he safely keeps with watchful and untiring eye. He slumbers not nor sleeps. Well, we return to Professor Gleason Archer, a very solid scholar, warrantable man. Um, whose views we read, whose views we interact with. Professor of Old Testament, I forget his PhD, I think it was from Princeton, if memory serves me right. But he's, uh, he also has a bachelor, uh, also has a, a law degree, which we see as enabling him to write very clearly as he does which is a delight. <laughs> Reminds us of Calvin, who liked to be economical and to the point, without prolixity. Calvin complains well, with some justification that St. Augustine was prolix, <laughs> wordy. Well, Gleason Archer's not wordy. He's got a lot of words, or, you know, 500 and some odd pages here. We're near towards the end. Um, we're picking up with one of the post-exilic prophets. We've looked at uh, Zechariah, Haggai. These are the post-exilic prophets. And I am inclined to put Ezra into that community, that the history that he writes with the Chronicles. And Ezra, and if he's the author of Nehemiah, I tend to view that as prophetical, although... In terms of the canonization process, uh, there were some other views on how the books got put in the order that they do. We covered elsewhere the two councils of Jamnia, uh, 91 and 118, where a few books were discussed by Jewish rabbis and the concept of the canon. And we get, once again, very early, the first century, the view of the true Catholic Church of the 39 canonical books of the Old Testament. So the, the Protestant, the true Protestant, by true I mean those that haven't rejected their heritage or their foundations, which is the true Catholic continuing church, um, embrace the 39. Our canon is exactly like the Jewish rabbis. So back to Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. The most reasonable explanation for the meaning of Malachi Malachi in Hebrew, is that it is hypochoristic. I've never seen the term before. I need to look that up later. Hypochoristic for the full form, Malach Yah, or Messenger of Jehovah. In its abbreviated form, the name could only mean my messenger, or possibly, if an adjective, one charged with a message. It should be noted that many authorities have expressed uncertainty as to whether the real name of the author has been preserved. Such doubt is grounded upon the fact that the Septuagint translates 1-1 one, one as by the hand of his messenger rather than by the hand of Malachi. This discrepancy would indicate a textual variation. The Septuagint must have read the final letter at Vav, meaning his rather than the final yod of the Masoretic text. On the other hand, it should be noted that the Septuagint entitles the book Malachias or Malachi. The Targumic tradition indicates uncertainty since it paraphrases the first verse by the hand of the messenger whose name is called Ezra, the scribe. Ooh. Was Malachi a scribe in Ezra's seminary? We're convinced 
Ezra had a school of students, a scholar without students. You can take the teacher out of the school, but you can't take the school out of the teacher. And a man like him with his academic interest has got to have had men around him studying. Well, we press forward here. That's a fantastic, interesting, Targumic tradition. It should be observed that every other prophetic book in the Old Testament bears the name of its author. It would be strange if this were left anonymous. So we're kind of got to deal with the doubts of some of the critics in context. Moreover, if the archetype or previous manuscript used by the Septuagint spelled Malachi's name with a long-tailed yod could be easily have a mis misunderstood as signifying his messenger. Okay, we're going to stop with this paragraph about the yod or whether it had a yod or not yod, whether it means my messenger or Malachi's <coughs> academic quibbling. We're used to it. It's okay. The theme of Malachi is that sincerity toward God and holy manner of life are essential in the Lord's eyes if his favor is to be bestowed upon the crops and the nation's economic welfare. Israel must live up to her high calling as a holy nation and wait for the coming of the Messiah, who by a ministry of healing as well as ministry of judgment will lead the nation to the realization of her fondest hopes. Now for an outline of Malachi. Introductory appeal, God's love for Israel. Second, oracles against the priests for dishonoring the Lord. The neglect of their liturgical functions. We see that all the time. No one. Morning prayer. The order for daily morning prayer throughout the year. And yet our brothers in the cloth don't do morning and evening prayer every day. And then insincere corrupt teaching of the law. This is in Ezra's time and forms the basis of the exhortation to be Bible people, canon people. Again, we're constantly on that point. The canon, the canon, the canon which tells you something about Malachi again. Oracles against the laity, treachery towards God and divorce and mixed marriage, warning of judgment, repentance and tithing, vindication of the godly against sneers <laughs> of the cynics in the day of the Lord. For 440-ish, BC, cynics in that time, that'd be roughly around the time frame of uh, Plato would be a little earlier. Cynics of the day, true then, true today. Concluding admonitions to keep the law and wait for Christ's coming. Now we turn to authorship and composition. As indicated above, the name of the author was probably Malachi. The tar Targumic tradition that he was Ezra is hardly worthy of consideration. Um, oh, if so, tell us why. We're kind of wait for an answer, Professor. And apart from that, we have no knowledge of his background or circumstances. Judging from the internal evidence, it seems clear that his prophecies were given in the second half of this fifth century probably around 435 B.C. This is before Alexander the Great now. And it, the exiles have been repatriated to the land. The second temple has been built. They've had some issues, as Ezra and Nehemiah point out, and Malachi. And uh, they will remain under Persian dominion. That is Israel until Alexander the Great and it brings Israel under the Seleucid Empire, Seleucid Kingdom, 
until finally down to Roman takeover with Pomp General Pompey coming in in 63 BC. We come to the, this conclusion from the following indication. First, the temple had already been built, rebuilt, and mosaic sacrifice reinstituted. What does that tell you about the canon in 435 BC? referring back to the Mosaic and Levitical materials of the 15th century B.C. It tells you what that long-standing millennial, let that sink in, a millennium since Moses had lived. This coordinates very nicely with Josephus' comments that, and Philo's comments, Philo, that the rabbis, a thousand, the rabbis would rather die a thousand deaths than to alter a syllable of Moses. Or Josephus' comments on the sanctity and providence of Moses in relation to 1,000 year reign of Moses, the Mosaic Constitution, until then down to Jesus' time. It's the true son of David, the final son of David. The second point, a Persian governor in 1.8 was in authority at the time. Hence, it could not have been during either Nehemiah's governorships, 445 and 433. Sin, three, the sins which Malachi denounces are the same as those of Nehemiah had to correct during his second term. Also, priestly laxity, neglect of tithes, impoverishment of the Levites, intermarriage to foreign women. It's reasonable to assume that Malachi had already po protested against these abuses in the years preceding Nehemiah's return. Hence, a fair estimate would be 435 B.C. Even rationalist critics, we don't uh, use that term, rationalist, it just is too, too flattering. They like the term because it imputes that they're the only ones who do the good thinking. And I don't know why. If I were in Pro Prof. Archer's class, I would advocate and lobby for a new term, such as the irrationalist critics. They're irrational in their assumptions. Inquisitors. We're getting ready to read Robert Dick Wilson, professor at Princeton. He just calls them inquisitors. Not all of them, but some of them are really headed out for the can. Even rationalist critics, well, this is what the prof has, for the most part, find no objection to this date, although a few, like Pfeiffer, Pfeiffer prefer to date him somewhat earlier, about 460, in his introduction to the Old Testament, page 614. Nor do they question the integrity of the book, either on stylistic or ideological grounds, since they can see that a messianic coat may have been cherished by the Jews as early as the late fifth century. <laughs> uh, well, we now pass on to chapter 32, introduction to Hebrew poetry. Um, then chapter 33, the Psalms, the great having a professor to teach us. Um, we're not at the mercies of Facebook scholars and scholars on social media who don't, won't do the reading but like to talk and be heard. We do the reading. We, we let the professor speak. <coughs> In chapter 34 on the book of Wisdom, Job, and Proverbs, we're going to start some new studies on that. Um, and so we got some work yet, some distance to travel, but now an introduction to Hebrew poetry. Many 19th century critics why wow, I use the term 19th century critics assume that the Hebrews were incapable of cultivating hymnic, lyric, or didactic poetry until fairly late period and then only under the influence of their more cultured neighbors Pure theory. Pure supposition. Pure postulation. 
that must be submitted to if you're to be accepted in the doctoral program here at Yale, so to speak. The more radical representatives of the rationalist school felt confident in ruling out not only Davidic authorship of any and all the Psalms, but even of the composition of any of them prior to the Babylonian exile. They did not hesitate to assign a substantial number of them to the Maccabean period, 160 BC. The same is, I didn't know they brought out their wrecking balls on the Psalms. I knew they did on the Pentateuch and other places. I mean, it was a full out assault. Now, now for me, finding out they also took the wrecking ball to the Psalms. The same is true of the other poetical book books, Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon, were all considered definitely post-exilic. In the 20th century, there has been a trend toward moderating this view and conceding that at least some of the Hebrew productions went back to an early period, especially in their original oral form. The discovery of an increasing number of Akkadian and Egyptian hymns has clearly established the early cultivation of this genre by Israel's neighbors in the second millennium BC. More recently has this been supplemented by the Ugaritic poetry that we're going to be studying um, the religion and archaeology of these surrounding neighbors of Israel in the third and second century of uh, millennia. But that's very typical, uh, you know, 19th century. I mean, they just bring that wrecking ball out and say things in, in, in a form of dogmatism that is kind of funny now if you look back on it, but not so funny because of the hubris. Now, you got of humility. We learn that with Psalms and everywhere else. We look outside this creation. A little bit less talking. More worship. More Bible. Composed in the Canaanitic, Ugaritic poetry, composed in Canaanite language very close to Hebrew, and dating from the 15th century BC. Whoa. Most modern critics, therefore, now concede the possibility of early elements going back to the time of David. Well, what about Moses' Psalm of 90? What about the, the, the song, the, the rejoicing song in Exodus 15 after the conquest? And there's some other songs, 15th century. The increasing amount of religious and didactic poetry recovered from every culture with which Israel had contact prior to the exile makes it increasingly dif difficult to defend the post-exilic thesis of these books. In fact, we may say that these non-Israelite productions of Semitic poetry compel us to conclude that even Hebrews must have commit committed their verse to written form unless they were very backward culturally by comparison with their neighbors. That won't obtain for Moses, will it? And he had a school of scribes, too. He's raised in that. Characteristics of Hebrew poetry. The most noteworthy characteristic of Hebrew poetry is parallelism. This term refers to the practice of balancing one thought or phrase by a corresponding thought or phrase containing approximately the same number of words, or at least the correspondence in ideas. In modern times, uh, uh, this is, what, yeah, 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 excuse me here. The earliest systematic treatment of Hebrew parallelism was made by Bishop Robert Loth, or Louth, L-O-W-T-H, in his work, The Sacra Poese Ebriorum Prilectionis Academicae, Lectures on the Sacred Poetry of the Hebrews, published in 1753. We definitely, after this, are going to look up 
and see if we can get that book and put that in the queue on the Psalms. He was a Church of England a bishop. And as some of you may or may not know, um, the Psalter, we do five or six, four or five Psalms every day. And in the cathedral tradition, going back centuries, they've been singing the Psalms uh, every night at even song, although regrettably, recent vintage, they've cut out some psalms that uh, refer to God's holiness and God's judgment and God's destruction of his enemies. Some of them, that's basically the ethos of modern Marcionism. I tried discussing that while I was at Salisbury Cathedral with the public affairs officer who gave a beautiful interaction and then there was a benedictine anglican monk there um, and i asked him about marcionism he goes who's marcion and automatically i knew this guy didn't know any church history which struck me as odd and i said i told him who marcion was and he was in fury i mean he got wrathful stormed off. It was really weird. Fortunately, the public affairs officer was there. We continued for another 30 minutes having a tremendous conversation. But that Benedictine Anglican was rash, hot-headed, like some of the anti-intellectuals we get in some of the social media forums. Yeah, moderators too. Thinking of one in particular, he's a book burner. It's terrible. We're not book burners. We read books. This is Prof. Lisa Archer, a serious student. Anyways, and I, on that issue of have, cutting out some of the Psalms, I had a great discussion that same evening with the director of music for the cathedral. A wonderful man. Great discussion. Finally, I said to him, I said, well, what? And again, it, in the same tone of voice that I'm using now, very calm, thoughtful, investigative, inquiring. I said, well, what do you think Dr. Thomas Cranmer would do? He got a big smile. He said, he'd have probably kept them. I said, yeah, I think so, too. But anyways, it's a long tradition in the Anglican uh, cathedral tradition of singing the psalms and it's a beautiful, so 97, 98% of the Psalter is sung. And it's such a glorious experience to go to even songs in the cathedral. So I wish I lived at Cambridge. I'd go every night to King's College and, and worship, do evening prayer. But we're out here in the farm fields of eastern North Carolina. Back to... Uh, the Psalter, we still got a little more time here. That he, Bishop Louth, identified three types of paralysimus membrorum, synonymous, antithetic, and synthetic. More recent authors like S.R. Driver, he's a big name in Old Testament studies, have added a fourth type, the climactic. We may illustrate these various types with the following examples. Here's synonymous parallelism. Psalm 24, 1, the first phrase, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And then the second phrase is the world and they that dwell therein, kind of amplifying. Psalm 19, 2, day unto day, first uttereth speech, and then the parallel, night unto night, show of knowledge. It's beautiful. Now we have the second type, antithetic parallelism. And I'm afraid in back in my graduate days, I, I've been through this before, but this is today kind of helping to amplify and affirm, confirm, strengthen the grip. I'm afraid I went through this too fast in earlier years antithetic parallelism, Psalm 1-6. 
first phrase, for the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. And then in contrast, the second phrase, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. This type is particularly common in the book of Proverbs. Now for synthetic or constructive parallelism, something that in the second sentence completes or compares or gives a reason for the synthetic. Psalm 2, 2, 6, first phrase, yet I have set my king second upon Zion, my holy hill. Another one, Proverbs 15, 17, better is a dinner of herbs where love is, second line, than a stalled ox and a hatred therewith. Then another synthetic constructive where the second phrase uh, adds to further idea, not identical second phrase or not antithetical but an enlargement just a different version of parallelism 26 4 proverbs answer not a fool according to his folly lest thou be like unto him and then a climactic parallelism psalm 29 1 Verse 1, observe, ascribe to the, unto Jehovah, O ye sons of the mighty, praise, second two, ascribe unto Jehovah glory and strength. There are other types of parallelism, parallelism, which are discussed by some authorities, but those listed represent all the really significant types. Chiastic parallelism is a subtype of synonymous parallelism, but instead of giving the parallel ideas in order, and then it's good. And then there's stair like parallelism one, two, three, four. Well, this may be a good place to stop as we pick up the next subject of the question of rhythm in Hebrew poetry. Verse 3 of hymn 668. Thy faithful guardian is the Lord, thy shelter and thy shade, nor sun by day, nor moon by night, need make thy soul afraid. Let us pray. Lord, you've given us grace at this time to come and make our common deliberations before thee. So grant that they may be a right, correct, of good doctrine, of good spirit, that the light of God may shine anew and afresh in these times of darkness. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost.